introducing me. I am, I, I, I used to be, I am just a professor of complex design. I am in a group which is called the financial computer analytics. I am, uh, well, somebody told me, I, I are the finance guy. Yes, I am the finance guy. <laughs> and uh, uh, actually, it's a pretty large group. I mean, uh, academics wise, I mean, 15 people, about 50 PhD students. Uh, and I mean, we have three, four masters now, and with a couple of other students every year. And uh, we founded the Center for Blockchain Technology. We are now funding Center for Sustainable AI, and you know, and all this kind of stuff. We keep me busy, and sometimes of nice things, sometimes of much less nice things. But uh, I would say my work. Uh, I mean, my work on packing has become uh, small, but uh, my work is about modeling, modeling complex systems, modeling from data, modeling from uh, you know observation. So in this sense, and what I tell, I will tell you today, is a bit more on the mathematical side, but is exactly into this, and is an active research activity. I will tell you a bit more. In a second. First of all, I mean, I'm drawing a time. Uh, I mean, you, you or most of you more than me, where you have to justify your research, and which is not what is it interesting or not, but that bullshit. I mean, you have to say that it's useful. Well, this is very concrete problem because that problem is essential in making concrete. Okay, and uh, um, indeed, to achieve best performances with concrete, one should obtain minimum porosity. Minimum porosity of water, well, of the ensemble of concrete and the granular stuff inside. The granular stuff inside literally get compared to, get, I mean, we all know that the packing fraction of equal grains go between 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. I mean, you might get 0 0.7 in somehow to get all the way to 99, 95, what, what, what you want for concrete, you need to have poly dispersed. If you have large poly dispersed, increase, we can get to one. Okay, with infinite poly dispersity. This is the limit of infinite poly dispersity, is what we uh, address, what I address today. By the way, this is a, a very long history. I, the very long history it started in two, around 200 before Christ by Apollonius of Pergia, who described a method where you put a circle, you put a actually three circles, you put a circle inside, and you continue the infinite this uh, uh, procedure. This was picked by many people in history, but certainly René Descartes, who wrote a letter, an equivocal letter to the Princess of Bellinia, talking about a kiss precise between circles, and where he wrote, where he found out the equation that links the radii of the three of the four circles. Then, uh, of course, Leibniz uh, found out this, uh, well, use uh, this method as an example for the tendency to the limit, so I mean the fact that it's an infinite uh, process that goes to zero. Uh, it, it's an example of fractal, of course, and the fractal I mentioned was first estimated, bond were first estimated by Boyd in 73, and then I mean a precise estimation that was numerical came from Magna and Hermann in uh, 2002, so quite late. And by the way, the problem is trivial, I mean, but it's not that trivial in the sense, I mean, it looks very much like, I mean, typical fractal, so the self skin gasket. I mean, I mean, we all know that we have, we have a mathematician. There is nothing, either it's, it's trivial, trivial, or it's impossible to solve. Right? <laughs> and, what they say. and actually, this, this belongs to the category that it might be impossible to solve. In the sense that, I mean, it, it, the, there are these very obvious sequences. You know, you have three circles, you put one inside, but these sequences kind of branch very, very quickly because, you know, you get neighbors with different sizes, etc. So actually, it is not, I mean, the, the principle is very simple. The actual mathematics will become very complicated very, very soon. Anyway, then at some stage, I mean, uh, in 2000, and, uh, sorry, the man was in 1991. In 2002, uh, someone thought at uh, doing this process randomly. So instead of putting precisely the circle inside the circles, to put them at random the center. By the way, I have a paper, uh, which I didn't put here, or because I mean, it's not a fundamental paper on the topic, but I mean, it is important. I had a paper that was by five years before where I, I, I did point this out from an experiment. Actually, I was looking at an experiment and it was look, looking very, very much like, like this one. I think they cited me. And uh, uh, then uh, there is, well, th then they, uh, they also extended the year really after two different shapes. Of course, I mean, once you start doing this order, why do the circles, or why you're doing this, you do something else. And then there is a fundamental paper by Gary 
and uh, Stefan, etc. That uh, I mean, fundamental because it's mine. And uh, <laughs> introduce which shapes introduce also rotations. Okay. Get I read. Hmm? I read. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, by the way, uh, it did not introduce only rotation. He found out some uh, again some universality, and I will talk about this in a second. Uh, by the way, uh, it's a very uh, present topic. Somebody shared on the chat, I don't know whom, uh, and this article about two students that actually proved that I mean, mathematicians were wrong. And, and I'm not wrong. I mean, there was a conjecture that apparently has a case that is not uh, built. And so, and this was what last week. So, in the sense, I mean, it is something that people are kind of excited and interested. Strangely, and we all say this, I mean, it's, it's, it's super fundamental for concrete. So, I mean, it should be, I mean, the basis of all research in packing. And uh, uh, it is mathematically fascinating. And there is a lot to do, I mean, in thermal modeling. It's not uh, such a big field, I mean, you know. Uh, we published a paper 15 years ago, and it is still one of the most cited paper in this field, and it has like 60 citations. So, I mean, it's, it's not something of huge interest. And I, I don't know why, probably because we don't go to conferences and talk about it. But anyway, uh, that's, that's fine. But that's good, because, be, why? Because, you know, from 2008, to 2023, we did work together, but I mean, actually, the point was that a guy was coming to see me, I mean, for like a, once or two, well, typically twice a year, before summer holiday, because Christmas holiday. I was an excuse for him to get, you know, holiday, a bit longer holidays, you know, and uh, of course, I was signing that he was working with me all the time. It was working, actually, we did work. The problem, we took, I mean, two or three days to remember what, where we were, and once finally we understood where we were, we had to be. No? So for 15 master, years, we've been working on what I'm talking now. Yeah? This is being recorded. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is from me. <laughs> so, and, and this is the way we, we work. And uh, so it's, it is a very active research line, although not, I mean, to, not intensively active research. Anyway. Uh, uh, I got into this problem. I mean, I said I got into the problem actually earlier. I mean, because I had this experiment of thin drops on the surface of alumina, and they were growing, and they were kind of when it grows, you know, they they cut together, and the the, 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 the pictures look very much like a and packing. So that were, but actually, I've been discussing this quite an extent in the book with Dennis on uh, packing. And uh, uh, and this is indeed the Apollonian packing. So yeah, you start from three circles, you put one in the middle, then you put one in the middle of these three, etc., etc., etc. This is the ordered one. And uh, in generally speaking, uh, there are some laws, and these laws, I mean, are unavoidable of this kind of process. So you have that the total number of grain with size is smaller or equal than a given R goes as a power law and it goes to infinite when the grain size gets to zero. The porosity also grows as a power law and in this case it goes to zero when the grain size goes to zero and these two exponents not by chance are related. The fact that they must be related is obvious I mean in any of this kind of process I mean you, you can't well the, the, you show an exponent they should be related to other. The exponent, well, the precise estimation of the exponent alpha, which is directly related to the fractal dimension, is one plus the fractal dimension, is 2.305684 for the Apollonian packing, and uh, um, which makes beta equal to 0 0.53. And uh, um, when you go to the disorder case, because other case is the same, I mean, again, you have this, this scaling law. I write it in this way in time of beta because, uh, I mean, uh, it's an inconvenient to have two exponents, so let's keep only one. And uh, in this case, I mean, in the first experiment, 2002, the first uh, visual simulation in 2002, they find out that beta was 0 0.28, independently on the procedure. I mean, independent procedure up to certain point, in the sense they were putting uh, uh, the center at random and then expanding the, uh, the circles until they reach, they touch uh, a neighbor, and they did it in a couple of different ways, uh, three different ways, and they were getting 
Then it's email exponents at and zero point. The size of the uh, particles is just taken from the Apollonian distribution? No, 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 you start from a large one, well, quite a few right. large ones, yeah. and then you start filling the gaps. Okay. Can I ask a really quick question? Do they know how the distribution of sizes is redistributed between the actual Apollonian? That, that's a particular distribution. So then you choose them at random in the centers. How does it affect? Well, you, 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 you start when in this method, what you do is you start from the center. Sure. So with zero right, right? and then you expand it until right. you touch a neighbor. So I mean the distribution is a consequence of the yeah, method. Yeah, but it's some mapping for distributions. Distribution. There is some mapping, okay. and uh, yes, and but the, the mapping is this exponent. So yeah, this exponent is two point eight, and the before was five point three. Got it. That's that, that's that's exactly right, and they are still I mean powerless. And uh, uh, as I said, they did also with different shapes, and shapes actually do matter. And you can get from very, very low beta to beta at 0 0.28, which is the random problem. But in then, I mean, the, the mid order one will go to 0 0.53. And as you can see, these are the plots. You see, you get the power laws. I mean, here in the, in the title, of course, the first bit is not power law because the process is not self similar. Then it starts becoming self similar and you get the power law. And this is a beautiful. Simulation, simulation, representation of the method by Gary. And that represents our innovation, which is okay, well, his innovation, which is start rotate the shapes. So, yeah, shape don't rotate. Once they kick uh, the other one, they stop. Yeah, they rotate. You can notice immediately that here they tend to end up with the vertex against a face. I mean, it's kind of obvious. And here they tend to end up face to face. And not always, of course, we are talking about disorder and things. So, I mean, it's not a theorem. Okay. And this is, as you can see, a little bit better experiment than the previous one. We see that after again a while, you do get very, very neat power laws. And uh, these are, well, at least four order of magnitude, but you can go. Or more, and you see that the beta are lower when you don't have rotation and larger when you have rotation. Okay, is, this is independent of what you start out with. You start out with four, it is completely independent of what you start what out with. Big. Yeah, yeah. It, it's independent because where you start out is yeah. okay. So, whatever happens here independent on the initial condition, but then the rest it, it depends only on the, on the process, and it's to some extent independent. Well. I, I will get there what it depends on. Okay. And okay, so of course, I mean, shapes, different shapes of different kinds, of course. And uh, I mean, uh, there is something mathematical deep in shapes. Some have even numbers and some have odd number of faces. The one, the, the symmetric one with even number of faces, have, you know, two parallel faces, the other don't, which makes quite a big difference, actually. And anyway, again, similar result. This is just for different betas. No rotation, triangle is very bad, the squares are bad, the pentagons are a bit better. Circles are the best for the value of beta. With rotation, well, triangle are still not too good, but squares are very, very good, and it's obvious why, because I'm by rotating, they can get face to face. And then you see they go down to the circles in the same way. Of course, rotations for circles don't matter because they are symmetric. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, I mean, ellipses, why not? And uh, this is uh, these are circles so ellipses with the, uh, um, what's it called? Aspect ratio. Aspect ratio equal to one. And here, this is an example for 0 0.8. And again, we see something quite similar starting for circles from circles are the same with rotation without rotation. You get that by getting elongated, the packing gets worse. Here, by getting elongated, the packing gets better, the packing, the beta gets better, and then eventually get worse. Well, it's kind of obvious that for very, very elongated, you might find trouble to get into place. But actually, there is a, a sweet spot where actually the uh, the ellipses pack better than circles, and this is quite known in packing. This is polydispersed, so it's a completely different problem. But I mean, we know for packing of equal 
size is this is actually true and is it much more neat actually yes so does that point depend on the size of the box then so if you made a bigger box no uh, no 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 the size of the box should not be an issue no it's not no, no actually it's not sorry uh, I, I was looking at gay but it's not at all because i mean we are talking about poly dispersed packing and we are looking at the takes so when once you once you get to calculate this exponent what you are putting in is infinitesimal with respect to the size of the box Sorry, you never see the type of the box. There could be a finite size in the sense the shape might occupy a, such a large volume that That's touches a large number of stuff. Yeah. But I honestly, I don't think that we are hitting that. I don't think so. Okay, this, so uh, I'm starting, uh, I mean, it's kind of obvious that this beta represents something related to the efficiency, which is shape, this, these shapes uh, are packing together. And, uh, and also it's kind of obvious that when you allow rotation, shapes pack together better. And when you don't allow rotation, uh, no, and not, then you have that, uh, for instance, squares packs very efficiently without rotation and very efficiently with rotation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a relation between the packing fraction and efficiency, well, between, sorry, packing exponent beta and packing efficiency. And let me kind of figure this out. I already pointed it out. What happened without rotation shapes tend to uh, hit the border on the uh, vertex, where I with rotation, they tend to hit the border on the face. These, I mean, if you, I mean, by the way, the method first should descend and then expand the shape. So, you know, this is more than this. Being this is more than this. The efficiency of the packing of this is worse than the efficiency of the packing of this. And uh, uh, we find, well, of course, I mean, th th then we could kind of estimate was the efficient of packing shape by shape just by considering, you know, whether we have to consider the vertex as a limiting size or we have to consider the face of a limiting size. And so, shape by shape, we have two classes. One, the limiting size is the distance from the face. In the other one, the limiting size is the distance from the vertex. Okay. And from that, we can kind of figure out where the exponent beta should go. And uh, well, this is Gary's. Ah, of course, for ellipses, it's a little bit more complicated because ellipses don't have uh, vertices. And of course, you expect to end up somewhere here in the average point uh, there if you uh, if you hit the, uh, the vertex, or I mean, you end up here if you can rotate them there. And uh, and that is indeed what we find out in terms of average and uh, this is the figures i showed you before so let's uh, re-plot this figure by using this limiting distance where with rotation is the face uh, without rotation is the vertex and what we find is that with exception with extreme ellipses we get a fantastic with this is the details of this, a fantastic linear plot where I mean all the shapes or the betas of the shapes come together once the uh, they are plot against what an effective area of the grain. Okay. So this was this was actually the PRL paper 2008. Essentially, we ended up there. We had the formula for this area. This formula was sorry, this formula sorry for this linear fit. This linear fit was just a fit with the area and we find out the coefficient of it was uh, 0 0.0.5 ac where ac is this effective area so i mean there was essentially no adjustable parameter except that there is a fit for the linear thread if, cool if you did um uh rectangles would they follow the ellipses probably in that uh yeah, yeah they, they we do have rectangles here yeah. That's good. Again, a related question. Uh, Suppose uh, we don't have rectangles here, but we have rectangles later. So yes, no, no, the answer no, is yes. No, they, no, they, no, they do. No, they no. do for. Uh, okay. They, 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 depending on the topic, I'm not completely sure. Do they bend 
I'm not sure if they found a plan. Are you trying to decide if it's the curvature issue or the. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I have no idea, but uh, he did the experiment. So yeah, I'm not sure we don't have the data on the plot. So I'm not sure okay. if they bend or not at the high aspect ratio. I think they will possibly bend. Though. Yeah, they might. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Either, either of you guys. If, if you were to substitute, let's let's say a ellipsoid of inertia, although I'm not sure I want to say that, for your general shape, it would do the same. Yeah. Do you, how how do how do the how do the betas compare? To the so I need to you mean three dimension. I mean an ellipse of inertia in this case. Ah, okay. Yeah, just because you have these other shapes and you have the data, I'm just wondering if the same fit. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. I, my answer to you in, in a second. In a sense, okay. I mean, uh, we did try a large number of shapes, <clears> including <throat> funny shapes. And uh, and now, I mean, in the last 15 years, we work it up something that is much more general than this. Okay. That's why this we have this universal law, and otherwise I won't be here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, well, first of all, uh, so, so this is the, so that was the PRL. Then we started messing around a little bit. I mean, he had to justify his mission. So, I mean, I guess he had paid per day as well. So, he <laughs> had <laughs> to provide some report. And uh, so, we, we said, okay, what happens if we mix shapes? So, we do triangles and uh, hexagons. Why not? And the, uh, oh, well, these other mixers. And actually, the result is that we still have the same kind of behavior with the next parameter, which is actually the average of the two, which is a kind of, you know, it's not that common to have linear relation between uh, in, 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 in fractals, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of strange, you know. And, but however, if it, it fit our idea, okay, beta is the packing efficiency. So, I mean, you mix two shapes, one more efficient, one less efficient. I mean, they mix randomly. So, I mean, no, the efficiency is the average of the two. I mean, strange, but not absurd. Mix them evenly, I suppose. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, yes, of course. You put, you put you put the same number, yes. Yes, actually. Well, did you did we try to make well I guess that I mean it's kind of obvious that it's going to be yeah, we, we mix it like 90, 10, 80, 10, and 20% of one. Okay, so 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 it dies it dies to the it dies to the weighted average, yes. I, I knew somebody used to take averages the wrong way and consistently was doing it right. Yeah. He was an administrator at a university. <laughs> you have to also tune the, the areas, right? So you could mix them, but once very small and very large wouldn't work, right? So they have to have similar areas. As well? No, because I mean, you know, that's fine. So to some extent, you, you don't predefine the area. They, 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 they get the area that they can, and then eventually you get the distribution. Mm -hmm. But be careful because this result, which is, we all agree that that is what it should be. However, that is not always the right, the, the right answer. Yeah. Thomas, so while you're here, so at the end of when, when you terminate your Bolognian packing, how is the mixing ratio then? How is the mixing ratio? Well, the mixing ratio is, is, is decided before. So you take one shape, one triangle, one well, you have different sizes that they grow. Ah, the, 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 the size is what? The, 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 the power is the same for both. The exponent is the same for both. Otherwise, uh, I mean, I'm not saying 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 I'
whereas pentagon banana, and that is the average, and that is what you get for the pixel. So you can see that I mean the different it does end up fantastically well on the uh, uh, average. However, if we do with rotation, this is not happening. Okay, <laughs> with rotation, the exponent is not the average exponent. Actually, with rotation, the exponent has nothing to do with both exponents. You can see the exact same plot. This is the exponent of the mixture, and these are the two exponents of the uh, other. So they even cross each other. So there is not a simple relation, of course. And we will spend time you know, to try to find some uh, nice fitting. <laughs> but I mean, it's not obvious, and it looks very different from, it, from each of the experiment. So what was looking very obvious is less obvious now. And uh, um, the uh, narrative, the understanding is that, okay, when we don't have rotation, the shape of the pore is not that important. That's the shape of the place where the, the grain is put. And therefore the grain essentially gets in randomly and the two exponent mixed. When you say there is rotation, the shape of the grain is important. So whether I can find the face to, to attach or not is getting crucial. And depending how you mix them, you get the, 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 to some extent the two uh, shape interfere with each other. And therefore, I mean, here they don't interfere, here they interfere. When they don't interfere, you just get an average. When they interfere, you get some a new phenomenon. And that is a kind of, I mean, narrative understanding. Uh, then, of course, but Gary, you know, Gary is, is a nerd, and also he kind of, you know, every time he comes with something, yes. And so he had the idea, okay, why don't we do with fixed orientation? I mean, yes, it's, it's all justification of it. Actually, it looks kind of beautiful. So, you know, I, I think it, it's a nice idea. So, you, you do uh, shapes, but instead of like rotating or putting them at the rotation at uh, uh, the arbitrary angle, you keep fixed angle. Of course, I mean, there is some uh, intelligence here because I mean, you know exactly where they end. You know, either end on the, you know, if you put the orientation in, in this way, you know, they two end face to face. I mean, it's kind of unavoidable. And, uh, um, and yeah, it is, so this is the random, this is the random with rotation, this is the random with fixed orientation for shapes. Okay, so triangle squares, so it is and here there are some interesting facts that we can note. Uh, so first of all, the, uh, the exponent is with the fixed orientation is similar to the one without orientation for, for triangles and hexagons. Definition of odd number of uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it's not right. Yes, yes, yeah, it's not right. So, no, no, for triangles, exactly. This is what's wrong. And instead, uh, you get the um, the rotational is the same for square and exactly. So, uh, so that, that should be should be put the pi, was it? So, the, the odd was right, uh, uh, but the Box was around. Okay. So again, uh, again, there is some intuition, you know, because if they can arrange, then this is equivalent to this because they go face to face. If they uh, cannot arrange, this is equal to this, and this is equal to this because they end uh, vertex to vertex. So I mean, this this kind of understanding makes sense, and. Uh, uh, and then, I mean, as I said, I mean, we tried all the possible, as I said, I mean, he's a nerd, so we tried all possible stuff for inside this kind of all the shapes, you know, where, you know, where you have uh, holes in sides and etc. Why not? And first of all, they all follow, I mean, of course, this, this, this fractal slows. And second, you get these strange exponents. I mean, uh, and uh, always you get that, I mean, with rotation, you get larger beta, without rotation, we get smaller beta. Um, So I promised, I think I'm very good with time. I promise about uh, universality. And first of all, the fact that the number of uh, shapes with the radius smaller than R should go as a power law is unavoidable. OK? 
Okay, that is uh, the, given by the fact that you have a self-similar process. I will not even use the word fractal. I mean, once it is uh, similar, it's unavoidable. You get a power bar. As consequence, uh, was, or the same way of looking at the same problem, the porosity must also go must go as a power law, and therefore these two. You have these two exponents that, as I said, must be related. And this, by the way, is true also for real fractals. I mean, in the sense you don't need the two, two, two. I mean, for uh, for order fractals, it's true for the order Apollonium, and it's true for the order for the original Apollonium. It's true for all these random stuff with different shapes, etc. The only thing that changes are the exponents. Bit of mathematics. Same point. So the fact that you have these power laws, so you have, you have two facts. I mean, it is hyper, it's hyper trivial. First fact, you have a power law, a power law in the uh, number of shapes. And uh, uh, second fact, you have to fill a volume. So let's suppose that we are already in the middle of the process and uh, we get a typical core and we put inside, we start putting inside grains, okay? And what's happening is that, well, we move to the continuous limit. This process is a sort of continuous in the sense, I mean, it's not purely continuous. There are tricky bits here, and uh, these tricky bits are completely ignored by us. Uh, uh, they could have some consequences. But anyway, you put a grain of volume DGR, and you have that the number of this grain is the derivative of the cumulative uh, number of grains. And you integrate over R from the beginning of the process at zero to R, and that should give you the entire volume you have. Then you do this integral, which is kind of trivial, and what you get is something like this, okay? So you have the total volume, that in this case, the volume where you started from, is filled up to R by uh, in, in, in this way, okay? Now, when you get R that goes to zero, these should become equal to the total volume. So the total volume is equal to some uh, uh, well, uh, initial volume you have time the size of the grain at stage zero, time the number of grain at stage zero, which is one, by the way, times the coefficient, which, contains the exponent alpha. Why I got all this way? Because these are all non, and the exponent alpha, this is the dimension of the space, the exponent alpha can be then retrieved from this. And if you, if you do this process, you find out that d e minus alpha plus one divided alpha minus one is equal to the packing fraction. The packing fraction of what? the packing fraction of the typical grain in the typical core when the process has become self-similar. And by the way, this family number is equal to beta. So the exponent we're looking before. So now makes everything makes good sense. So when we're looking, I mean, a packing that were more efficient or less efficient, indeed, are packing that feel better or worse the grain. The poor. And by the way, this is not trivial because we are talking, we are putting together in this concept both the shapes <coughs> and the methodology. Because there are shapes that pack better, but pack better depending on the methodology. Like we saw it, you know, the, the elongated ellipses do pack better than circles if they are data, otherwise they don't. And so, and this is super general. So, for instance, we, we never did the, uh, an experiment where you can move the, the particles. Of course, that will get much larger densities. And if you do that, you will get larger packing fraction, which means you will get larger beta. And this formula should still be valid. And uh, um, so by putting together the various uh, numbers, we get in the beta equal to uh, packing fraction when divided by the one minus the packing fraction. And then we can go back to our previous experiments and see how they work with this. Of course, to do that, we needed to estimate this packing fraction. 
this is non-trivial because we said this is the typical shape with the typical form. Well, what typical is, is, is a bit of a, a, a tricky question. And so what we do? Well, the idea is, okay, well, we, we, we look at experiments, but we look at experiments, uh, uh, not the, the full experiment. We take just uh, the packing at some stage. So we have pores. And we start filling the pores with grains, okay, of a given size. But even that, I mean, but if, if we do that, I mean, yes, we get the packing pressure. But then say, so, well, they left it more general than this. And we don't put grain of a given size or with a given rotation or rotation. We put sides, circles in it. We put circles in it because we know that circles are related to uh, uh, the packing fracture. The circles should be related to the packing fracture of the shape. There is a simple relation between what how efficient the circle fits inside the grain with how efficient the shape will fit inside the grain. And what do we uh, measure? experimentally on local packing. So we don't do any longer the, 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 the polydisperse. This is essentially this is one off experiment repeated. And so we have one grain, I mean, and one, one pore in one grain. And then of course we take several pores and several grains and we calculate say, for this, this, this coefficient A. This coefficient A is something related near to, to, to pi. So it's probably two or three, I mean, uh, depending on the shape. By the way, this coefficient A can be guessed because that is exactly what we were doing before. I and mean, if you look at the limiting distance, you will see that the coefficient depends whether you touch by, by the vertex or you touch by the face. And by doing so, so without any adjustable parameter, we look at all the previous packings. That's, that's the circular grain. And this is the result. So the A is calculated uh, uh, from the local simulation. This is known because we know, I mean, what the circle packing fraction in all the conditions. And these are all the shapes that goes from, you know, very funny uh, concave shapes that has very, very low efficiency in packing to uh, what, uh, what is it, I don't know. Uh, some uh, very active square in class yeah, square, yeah. so probably square, so something that is very, very thin on the back yeah. with rotation. So, I mean, very high packing fractions. And they all fell very, very well into this low. So, it looks like that we did the kneel down the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, ah, yeah, these are the shapes, triangles there, the circles are yeah, in the middle. And remember, this was, I mean, the PRL kind of uh, uh, fit that was working fine here, but was not working fine in this area. Now, I mean, they're working fine everywhere. So it's, uh, it, 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 it seems so. It seems that, I mean, this relation, so this relation between the, the beta and the packing fraction, the local packing fraction is super powerful and true for all shapes and all methodologies. And there is even more because, I mean, although, I mean, we did all in two dimensions and going to higher dimensions is not that trivial with these processes because, I mean, these are, you know, uh, these are uh, fractals, so you get a large number of things. But uh, the, uh, oops, this uh, is independent on dimension. While the different alpha depend on dimensionality of the space, the different beta do not depend on the dimension at the space. And this reasoning that made us <laughs> ending up with this formula is did not assume being in two dimension, in one dimension, or in any other dimension. So we expect this to work also for concrete. And by the way, apparently about 100 years ago, somebody uh, uh, proposed a, a formula for the porosity of concrete. And they say, look, I mean, you have to take the ratio between the smallest and the largest particle you put into the mix, and you take the power one over five. I mean, of course, uh, this one over five is quite an arbitrary number in the sense, I mean, it depends very much on water. We know now what, on the mixing first. 
well, certainly on the polyspecity, that would be large and should be also in the right ratio proportion. But then, but then even more importantly, is the fact that, I mean, you should be able to put the small particle inside the large particle. Well, they do go naturally, but we know they don't put that naturally because this is more segregation very, very, very easily. So, I mean, the way in which you mix things is very, very important. By the way, there is all the literature that, that tells about the importance of water. Water is what makes this grain flow within the pore of each other, but then you have to remove the water and that it makes things kind of bad, etc. etc. Anyway. By taking this one over five, it gets us a, a density, a local density about 10%. So, I mean, it is quite poor. It means that, I mean, you have a lot of empty volume inside each grain when you prepare this concrete, but it's not out of reason. I mean, I don't think you can get that well. And certainly, I mean, you don't have a fractal distribution here anyway, because, I mean, if you get large and small, but you don't have all the right progressions. So we are not far away, and we think that, uh, but we do think that, I mean, with this understanding, we can really actually say something about, I mean, how to make better concretes. I just want to ra raise my hand for the yeah. subject. Because you even have a little bit of it. So I, I think people, people know me. I've made a lot of concrete, by like real concrete, yeah. by hand, by hand. And um, the process is first you start out with the sand. Yeah. Then you add the cement. You mix it dry. Then you add water a little bit. Yeah. Get it enough. And then you add the coarser aggregate. Yes. So I don't know whether that, that notice the process. It was an intermediate thing. And no, well, okay. Find a thing and then I the very small stuff. No, okay. The, 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 the process you describe is, uh, is correct uh, and it's what normally you do. And first of all, you do with only two sizes. Yeah. So, when, when, uh, in the distribution, right. but two distributional right. sizes, large and small. So, that, that is clear you're not getting any fractal there. Yeah. Uh, although, I mean, probably this kind of relation are still vaguely valid, but I mean, uh, it's not. However, there are procedures, the scribe procedure in the literature, I don't know how much people do it, where you do get the distribution of sizes all the way from, you know, from uh, some uh, centimeters to actually some, you know, the use silica powder, they would go, go down to, 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 to microns, actually. When they're not micron, to the tenth of micron, otherwise they get uh, electrically charged. <laughs> and, and, but, but the mixing with water of the small ones is exactly because that, because otherwise you get segregation and you don't, you don't get it. So if you mix the dry one, you get in trouble. If you mix with water, First, the small one, and then you get a bit bigger. I was yeah. going to come back then to Apollonian packing because that's not the process. That's not the process for getting the Apollonian packing. It just occurred to me when you actually have a real yeah. thing, it's, it's different. Well, y yes and no, because I mean, if you, if you look at all these random Apollonian packings, I mean, of course, you're not growing in our grains inside the cement, which actually would be possible, by the way, uh, in the sense you could have, you know, a, a System that I mean, the crystal that form inside the, the, the evolution. But, uh, um, but however, I mean, when you mix, I mean, if you have this distribution, you start mixing. I mean, you will, uh, if you have a, a very good mixer, you will obtain a random appointment packing. That, 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 is, that, that is true. I mean, of course, I mean, you need an incredibly good mixer, which, uh, which, well, yeah, it's not very well. We have been simulating this kind of not for the Polina, but it's simulating how to mix grains for a long time. It's a huge problem. It's a huge industrial problem, by the way. It's extremely really big. Anyway, so that's the end of my talk. And a couple of, uh, well, an advertisement, sorry. Uh, there's a new journal, which is called Data Driven Modeling. And uh, please, uh, I mean, look at it and submit the uh, papers there. Uh, it's Brand new. <laughs> Actually, I was also looking for the other board member. <laughs> Please come and do and you know, these are the materials. Is there? So that's packing, definitely packing. Yeah. <laughs> In real packings of grains, like the concrete that you show. Friction is a big issue. Yeah. Frictionless granular materials and frictional don't yeah. readily pack into the same structure. So, what do you think of the impact of friction 
maybe there is an asymptotic behavior that would be universal, but is it? Uh... Well, I tend to believe, uh, I tend to believe, uh, I mean, uh, that should be proven, but I mean, I tend to believe that uh, uh, as far as you do, uh, you have an infinite number of shapes, so you have a very high for university, friction will just make packing worse. So reduce packing fraction. But uh, you will have still the exact same uh, uh, relation, both uh, with the, uh, well, first of all, you still have and you have uh, the uh, power law in the uh, sizes and then the numbers. And uh, I do believe you will still have the beta equal to the packing fraction. Just more. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be the, the beta that you have after some big amount of tapping and vibrating and so on, or? By the way, as you, as yeah, you should, okay, thing, okay, if you tap, you should get the beta beta. It's exactly as far as with the rotation uh, yeah. conditions. So because rotation is just a first liberty that you introduce yeah. into yeah. the yeah. system, then you could associate rotation yeah. with some amount of yeah. translation, yeah. maybe hopping into a nebulous yeah. cavity, yeah. but the whole panel of generalizations that yeah. you could imagine. Absolutely. The, the one without rotation, to some extent, it should be quite close to the friction limit because you know once you touch another one, you stop. Mm -hmm. So actually, should not be that far from it. Yeah, and so and so the behaviors if you look at the. Fixed rotations that are close to normal packings with infinite friction and with rotations that are very close to behaviors for um, zero friction particles. We look at things like triangular ellipsoids and packing fractions are analogies. Um, so, in the <coughs> parallel relation to the effective packing fraction, looks like there's apparent divergence. It's by zero, is getting close to one. Are there processes that you guys have played with where you start to get there? And I guess it's like so efficient that it, you know, I don't know what how it stops before you, you get to fractal or is that how far for it? Like, uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, we, we, numerical dimensions, we can explore a very, very large range of shapes, so also of, um, of sizes. So actually, we are not really getting any trouble. I mean, of course, I mean, when you get large, so when you start the process, you're not in a power law. Then you get in this power law regime and you can go on, uh, I mean, in principle forever. Of course, the time stage will diverge. It means that you need an infinite number of particles to fill the, 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 the force. But in a two dimension, I don't know, you get to some hundred millions, you know, so you get, you get very large numbers. What's the highest? Active well, how, yeah. how dense we get to the end? What is that uh, typical force? Yeah, what's the uh, yeah, we got the four decimal elite. Oh, yeah, for the profound density, yeah, 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 so you get very close yeah. to one. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, fantastic talk. Uh, when things break, I mean, when I'm thinking about the power loads, mm -hmm. it's really to me, important to think about if things break, and uh, if you take a sphere, it doesn't break into a sphere, right? So I think that the shape is intertwined to the, the, the basic. This, there is a, a shape distribution that would be intertwined with the size distribution, yeah. and things break eventually into silver ratio type of things, like an A4 that you keep holding, yeah, yeah. always keeping the shape. I think that 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 is interesting to think about it. The progression from the big size to the small size with shape shape as we go with the size of it. this is just I don't know I'm just making a comment. Uh, well, this could this could change uh, things because I mean uh, of course this is all based uh, on such similarity mm -hmm. so on the assumption that I mean uh, some from some stage on uh, I mean the typical grain the typical core is the same in terms of the dimensions. You start with changing the shape while you go down uh, or in dimensions. Uh, I think uh, it's the natural process, right? uh, yeah, yeah, which which is very realistic actually. Then we we'll, then you break that similarity, okay? which means I mean uh, you probably don't get your power lows, etc. So yeah. most likely you get quite far from well, not too far. I guess I mean we get I mean, to some extent in similar domain, but certainly not in the same. Okay. But a quick question from me as a curiosity, because this is a design. So, if you 
look at the number of contacts with such similarity to behavior both as well, because as you decrease the number and the size, it becomes important in terms of number of contacts. So we get this power law also. So thinking about the stability and also as a statistic, at what point if you want to bring in mechanics, if you look at the number of contacts, will you get the same behavior as people or do you to this? Well, in the Napoleon effect, in the number of contacts is a tiny yeah. object because large grains get to infinite the number of contacts. Uh, and, are, and everyone is large in yeah, and, and the fractal. Yeah, and what scale you get. But, but, they know, but then it, it's interesting because I just in the engine because, you know, the first grain you put that we get uh, the nature in the number of contacts because you have all the particle around. However, the last you put the uh, uh, more number of contacts, either three or two or three, depending if you are under uh, some uh, mechanical constraints that you need, the, you need uh, these three. And uh, uh, but the, the last you put uh, are much larger than the, the first are there because you have power law relation. And therefore, actually, the average state is like constant, or constant. Or constant. So, actually, it's quite interesting. The main, we never look at it, but actually, it can be. Uh, I'm, I don't know if people are studying it. Yeah. They should. It's yeah. enough time. Do you ever yeah. look at um, uh, distributions that aren't continuous? So, one thing we found is if you just start with binary system, you start same size, obviously, you just get right there's some disks here, you get uh, you know 84 percent like you expect. And then you start making one of them smaller, you do get a little bit of gain in the in the density. But when you get to the point where the small disk can fit yeah. into the intersections of the of the big ones, you get a big jump yeah. in density. There's a yeah. big jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one thing we've done, which makes very high packing fractions, even in dynamics, um, is to uh, take those that as the ratio. So a bunch of yeah. big particles, a bunch of Particles that fit in, and you can actually figure out what ratio of each one yes. you need. Yes. If you have a certain amount of areas, so it tells you yeah. exactly how many to put in. And then when you shake those, you really pack fast, even with only three generations of this. Yes, uh, uh, yes, and no. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, indeed, it's true. I mean, uh, and uh, we all know, you know, that the a lot of force here, if you can put this here, which is uh, what it is, I don't know, my pen from above of the of the previous etc. However, if you continue well after that you have broken the symmetry. And really? that is exactly what happened with Apollonia. It's not trivial because you have all these branches with different sequences. Right. That's so what we did was instead we said okay there's that that's the biggest one we can fit, but only one can fit in there. You keep making that one smaller and smaller, then that whole area gets filled in yes. with the smaller but the problem is that why the first ones have a precise ratio, the other depends on the neighboring. And the neighboring get complicated because I mean at the second stage you have one small and three large, and that's fine, we know it. But then you have one more than three large, two small, one, one small, one smaller, and they are the large, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have all these branches that go. All these branches together make a power law, but all these branches separately actually don't, don't are not as trivial as, as it sounds. And indeed, people have been actually. For literally hundreds of years, have been trying yes, I, I to think get these sequences, and they didn't get. I think what, they, 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 last last week, um, article. I mean, of these two mathematicians, it was exactly about that. They yeah. thought there was a sequence, and actually they found out that it was not. I think what we said was we we wanted twenty particles in that uh, in that thing, and that that acts like it's its own little problem. Yeah. Now it's just a it's a you're you're filling a triangular box with twenty particles. And then those all have the same size little boxes. And so then you're filling those with the yeah. 20th size. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What you can do, and that's what we did there, uh, you can do an exact uh, uh, ordered case, yeah. which is not a Polonia, mm -hmm. which is essentially the Sertinsky gasket or all the Pascal the triangles kind yeah. of packing uh, fractals. And that is general. And that's you can always put the, well, at each stage, you put the exact size in the exact box. The, the the equations are exactly the same, so you do you do get the same scaling of those. Uh, you do get uh, 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 a relation between packing fraction and the scaling law, but you don't get exactly the same relation. So I mean, uh, we are still uh, trying to figure it out so if one can find the same relation of beta equal to packing fraction for the the PC kind of problem or not, and we suspect we can't. But, uh, even if we make one say yes, five years. I think we might leave it just there. Thank you very much. That would be
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of doing super well, huh? Okay, Gary, if you could hear me, yeah. Yeah. I want to diagnose something that I've observed again over more than 50 years of making a I've done it for a long time, but it, I have a lot of experience with basically an extra many times. So I want to stick to the, the small size aggregate. What do you mean? Is it Next speaker contributed to a slightly shorter talk by Michael Engel from Ella. And quasi crystals and dense packing from the table. So, for you now. Thank you very much for uh, having me here and the introduction. And uh, I shortened the title a little bit compared to the program because I also had to shorten the, the content of the talk for two thirty minutes. But uh, you already see on this rather futuristic first slide where we are going. So we have tetrahedra. And uh, we are trying to pack them in space. And one common, one important theme in my my talk will be there will be a lot about experiments. So what we'll do here is we will the, the theory is actually pretty old. I will at the beginning of the talk I will wrap up the the theory which goes back to 2009 2010. So it's almost 15 years old. But all the experiments are new, and then there are new few aspects also on the theory side. And, and here you already see the, the idea. So we have the tetrahedra, they can pack theoretically. They can also make these uh, these uh, these clusters, spherical clusters, but they can also form quasicrystals. And then you see sort of a, this is actually experimental data. You see sort of a, a diffraction image here from small angle X ray scattering, and I will show you how we how we get there. So this image didn't exist on its own. This was actually 
this was part of a journal cover. So we got an uh, artist making this from experimental data. So this is not a real image. This is just computer rendered, but this just appeared last week. So this is super new. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there are uh, very important on experimental collaborators who I should give a lot of credit because without them, this work wouldn't exist. And there is the group of Indiana from Sing Shen Yi, a long term collaborator. They're making these particles. So we'll see these are small gold colloids. So they're really gold. And, and uh, especially Yi Wang and Yun Chen, who, did, who, who, who made the structures. We had in FAU, I'm coming from Erlangen, Germany. We had uh, we have a very good ex, uh, uh, electron microscopy group, and they did tomography. And so I will show you some tomography data. There is especially Alexander Gertz, who just finished his PhD, and Benjamin Ateleo Subiri, a group leader. They were in the group of Edmund Speaker. They were very important, and Rui Peng Li he did some uh, some uh, small angle X-ray scanner, and he actually made this simulation. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, where is my, so my group is working on different uh, topics. So we are looking at structure formation in, 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 in fluids and in solids. So that's the theme of my group. We are doing computer simulations. And for the purpose of this talk, we'll look at a specific system of, of uh, structure formation, which is on nanoparticles. That's a very common theme. I've written a very uh, long review on this topic. So those of you interested to get into this, you can read this up. And here I, I quickly summarize where where this is all situated. So we have, you can actually make small polyhedra. So we heard a lot about polyhedra yesterday, and I think there are a few more talks on polyhedra. So we can make real polyhedra on a nanoscale, so five to 100 nanometer edge length. We can make them in really large batches, uh, billions of, of these particles, very monodisperse. And you will see that they're super monodisperse. So I'm always amazed by how monodisperse you can make. They can make different shapes, cubes. Recently, also tetrahedra, they can make them branched and a lot of these shapes. But the problem is you cannot just make the shape because if you, if you have a small chunk of metal, for example, floating in solution, and there's another small chunk of metal, if they would meet, they would just form a bigger chunk of metal. There's nothing that keeps the, the surface from getting together, except if you, uh, if you functionalize the surface, so you put like a buffer layer on the outside. They're called ligands, so small molecules, organic molecules. This is usually inorganic, this is organic. You put it on the surface, it's like a hair, like a hair on your head. It's keeping the, the surfaces apart, and this way they cannot, they cannot join. But this has also some problems or advantages, depending on how you will see it. First of all, when you have these ligands, these molecules, they're interacting with other ligands, so they can be attractive. Another thing is when you put them on the surface, they will round the shape a little bit because it's like a layer around. So, uh, so that's something if you want to study packing of shapes that can, can be important to consider. And then you have that all in an environment. So when you really think about making an experiment, that's super important. You have, you have things like maybe you can do the electric field, there's depletion, there's temperature can play a role, confinements or all of these, these effects play a role. And eventually you can, uh, so it was a bit fast, you can make real materials out of this. And what I want to point out here is, uh, is, is also that um, there are different length scale and time scales important. So this is a really complicated problem to model uh, thoroughly. But we will try to make it very simple, look at shapes that are effectively hard. And that was also the goal in the experiment for this purpose of this talk. So we look at essentially hard, hard to packing. So you see the core is this size, the surface is relatively thin. So to, to not round the shape too much, the environment and also, Connected to the length scale, there's a time scale. So some things are very fast, the ligands, they, they move super fast and some things are, are slower. So typically an experiment to make such a, such a structure that is at the top here takes from a few minutes to a few hours, usually rarely to, to days. So you can actually, I've, I've, I've seen some experiments where you, it's, it's pretty low tech actually. Like the structures that you get out are super sophisticated, very small scale, but you first, Essentially, it's 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 all scale chemistry. You're, you're you're pouring together different substances, and you're growing these nanocrystals, and then sort of more or less with your hand, you can you can sort of uh, lift this off from the surface of 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 a, of a liquid. So it's uh, you don't need any expensive technology, but you have to know what you're doing still. Can I just say, uh, sure. Just on the slide back. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah. Sorry. yeah this is, this this is, is the part the time space. Yeah. I didn't quite get it all because it's hard to read the white blue, but 
Is it is it a times like this in school like, like square buffer the growth rate something like that? Um, well there are these in engineering in the glasses we often show these 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 multi uh, multi-scale um, modeling diagrams where we showed length versus time and I'm not sure if it's exactly the the square that's, that's or, like the diffu the diffusion. I mean right? yeah exactly diffusion it's this was what I just did. I couldn't do it faster than yeah. my head. I couldn't read some of this. This is really second to second, yeah. but this is also something from okay. from my experience. This is very, very okay. rough. This is not this is not meant to be an accurate okay. number. <laughs> this shows usually when you're smaller, you're faster. When you're bigger, it's it's slower. That's the, the general trend. Okay, so we are focusing for the purpose of this talk on tetrahedra. And a lot of the things that I will show you here. So the first seven slides are sort of repetition. That's pretty old. So that's from 2009. Actually, the first packing conference in Dublin, 2012, I presented some of the same slides, but I want to bring this up to sort of get us to speed where we read. And the theory is itself mostly out there. So we have a tetrahedron, and the tetrahedron is interesting because you can, yeah, this just doesn't work, because we can get interesting local packing. Like, uh, I mean, this is pretty well known, but we, we glued them together with some funny. And these are these are dice that you can use for, for playing board games. So you can make a, a, a pentagonal bipyramid, you can make an icosahedron, you can make add more layers, you can make a tetrahelix. And there's the interesting thing is they're all sort of um, not it's not possible to pack, pack them perfectly easily. Because if you have something that has icosahedral symmetry, yeah, it's just it just doesn't work so well with periodicity. So that's why this is an interesting shape. And we ran simulations again. This is a movie from 2009. So we put a lot of these tetrahedra in the box, in this case, uh, 2048 tetrahedra. And then essentially you imagine you have this box of tetrahedra and you shake it like crazy. That's what the computer does. And you just wait long yeah. enough. And then yeah. you missed the <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it spontaneously shook it. It was static on the screen. I'm shaking it now. <laughs> shaking it really. And uh, yeah, and then if you have the, the magic is if you have the right density, this will spontaneously order. And the right density is about fifty percent. So this is this is I think fifty one or fifty two percent. I remember. And you can if you carefully look at it, you see that there's there's heterogeneity. Like here it moves less, and here it moves a little bit more. And here it's actually it's ordering. And when it's ordered, the fusion changes and the rotation. So you can you can see that something is happening, but it's a bit subtle. So what we have to do is we have to put in a coordinate system and then we cut out some axes and we can actually see that it forms layers and forms these columns. And then these columns, they form, this is a layer. So this is, this is perpendicular, essentially cutting out here, such a layer. And I, I, need, that, I need that later, the structure, because we will see that in the experiment. So you have, you have here these, these rings. So this is one of these columns and uh, and actually, if you do a diffraction, this is a quasi crystal. So that's something that was super exciting back then that you can get such a simple shape like a tetrahedron, just a hard shape, and it forms a super complicated structure with this high symmetry. So we were super excited back then to get that. But let's look a little bit more at the structure. So um, the structure, uh, you have the tetrahedron, and the tetrahedron form these pentagonal bipyramids. So five tetrahedra form this green ring. And they can also form this red ring, which is 12 tetrahedra. And the green and the red sort of alternate, like you see it here, like red, red, green, red, green. So the green fits very well into the red ring. And then these columns, they, they have faces which are a little bit tilted. They can come together face to face, like here in the triangle or in a square. And the gaps can also be filled quite nicely by additional tetrahedra. Here you put one, here there are actually four per layers. You only see two at the top, and there are two rotated by 90 degrees. Per layer. <laughs> so there's the hierarchy, tetrahedra, they form rings, the ring <laughs> form these rocks, these columns, and then you can form square and triangle tiles. And then if you have a square and triangle tile, you can you can tile this. I mean, this is periodic in this direction, but in the other direction, you make a square triangle tile. Uh, so you see the rings are slightly tilted. This will be important uh, to optimize density. And uh, this doesn't work. The adjacent locks, they are face to face. I mentioned that. Uh, and that's, that will be super important at the end 
we already in 2009 we observed that these these objects are not perfectly flat so well, that will that will become important and they, they have some curvature to it and this one is like it's like a has like positive Gaussian curvature the triangle it can be either uh, sort of convex or concave so both directions and the square is like a saddle so yeah it has negative curvature and now you imagine if you want to make actually you can when I go back here you can you can see that a little bit this is wavy yeah so this is this curvature thing you I mentioned uh, so we'll we'll see that later in the experiment and now if you want to make a tiling you have to combine squares and triangles just to get zero curvature and average. That was our rational argument in 2009, why this actually formed and why it's not just squares and not just triangles. This, by the way, is also important in, in experimental systems. So these square triangle tilings are found in experiments. They were found uh, in, in alloys. They also found, we, we heard yesterday that in block copolymers, they're also the sigma phase, is essentially square triangle tiling. There is also a reason why they don't just form squares and triangles and often, Curvature aspects play a role there as well, very similar to here. So another thing we also did, this is a year later, we looked at pack dances packing. So here we, it's, it's a mathematical optimization problem, just saying tetrahedra, well, how dense can you get them? And you start with just, you, you do it in small boxes, one tetrahedra and you make it periodic two and so on. So these are all numerical results. So the dances packing of single tetrahedra, this is known since, I think since decades, uh, it's 0 0.36, so 36%. Then if you pay two, there's a jump to 72. And then you sort of goes to essentially two third. And for four, this one is the densest packing that is currently known for tetrahedra. And there's actually a stick that's helpful. So here's the, the densest packing. And then of course it repeats when you have eight, you just you just has to be the same and so on. And we essentially can can here see success rate. We do simulate annealing to get these packings, and that works quite well. Uh, and interestingly, the dances packing is quite different from the quasi crystal from this self assembly result. And we were also aware of that. And that's the last slide from the old work. So we made this phase diagram, which sort of is was our understanding in 2010. We have a fluid of tetrahedra. Then there is a, a spontaneous first order phase transition to the quasi crystal. And then there's coexistence. So there's a, it's like a first order. When you have first order phase transition, there's always coexistence because there's a density jump uh, in here. It's the same with for spheres. For spheres, you have a fluid and then you have FCC here. For fluid, the, the jump is between 49 and 54%. And here it's between 47 and we don't know exactly 51 or 52% here. And you have the quasi crystal. There's also an approximant. So I will not, I don't have time to really talk about that part. But then there is eventually a tie density to the Dunbar packing. And in simulation, we can never get there because the phase transition is just at yeah, 84%. So everything is jammed and there's no more dynamics. Okay. Yeah. So, so my memory is that the uh, so called, well, the Pruden result by, I uh, guess it's Carlos and uh, yeah. Gravel and yeah. by Elser, I think, is essentially close to one, right? It's, it's, it's a 99% or something. It's, it's, the, the Pruden upper bound, I, mean, I guess it's. It's 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 not it's just an epsilon less than one I think but you yeah know, just, you say it's about eighty five is what you get for the diver yeah I mean there's pr proving anything here mathematically uh, from, for me it's totally impossible but also for for real mathematicians it's nearly impossible uh, so I think the best that has been proven it's not one so that the tetrahedra cannot pack space and I think it's yeah. like one it's minus like, ten to the 20, minus twenty seven or, or something, something like that. So it's like the point is a lot of room though for possible improvement yeah. and dimer, but maybe not. But we did like I would say numerically we we did there was a lot of effort there to really get this better. So uh, maybe there's something hidden. I cannot I cannot exclude that. But if it's if then it's only a tiny, there's only a tiny uh, improvement possible, not much. Can I ask in that symbol? Yeah. Um, with these, did you enforce cubic symmetry way back when? No. no. Okay. This is, this is actually, if you mean this result, this, we, we allowed the box to, to shear and to change shape. And so this is really the, the dances packing given this number of particles. The quote unquote floppy box? Yeah. We, we didn't there was a, there is a paper on the floppy box method in principle we did the same thing but we didn't 
we are not aware of their paper at that time. We just we just did it in our way. Yeah. Okay. So this is all old. So and then uh, our question already back then is: Can we do ex any experimental realization? And uh, we talked to uh, we talked to uh, groups with like seven years. They said no, we cannot make tetrahedra because it's very hard. The, the the sharp edges are a problem. They are a problem in the sense that when you grow a crystal, and when you get a polyhedron, this is usually a wolf shape. So that means um, it's a thermodynamically equilibrium state, but it's pretty hard to get sharp sharp edges just because thermodynamics tries to round things. Vertices is even harder. Uh, particles also are not pretty hard. So I, I told you about the ligands. So you have to put the molecules on surface that rounds it and that makes them uh, maybe attractive or just just not really hard. And also it's hard to get more than this enough. And uh, now in 2021, uh, first time uh, they said, yeah, maybe we can do that. Uh, uh, at least we have an idea where we have to go. We need to be uh, we need to, it, we cannot go too small because then it gets more rounded. We cannot be too large because then we uh, we don't have enough uh, thermodynamics. So these things have to be in motion. They have to try a lot of uh, posi uh, possible orientations. So time has to, if you make things smaller, they are faster. So you have to make them small enough so that you access long enough time scale. So this is the range where you can work at. Uh, we can do a ligand exchange, so that means you grow the particles first, and then you remove the ligands and put other ligands on place. The ligands are also uh, so that way you can you can sort of make them more hard, and also we can purify them, so we can put them in a centrifuge, or we have other methods to sort of uh, to sort of uh, make them more and more dispersed. And actually, uh, gold might do it. Uh, you can grow a lot of different shapes of gold. It's quite amazing, depending on how you synthesize. You can. You can make uh, uh, rhombic dodecahedra, octahedra. You can make you can make platelets. There, uh, you can make uh, icosahedra also with that. It's quite quite amazing, and it's still not fully understood from the experimental side. It's also one other research project we have right now is to understand how we can grow different types of crystals. So an experiment is it's typically by trial and error. So they put all kind of chemicals in the synthesis process, and then they get certain shapes, and they know exactly if I follow this recipe. Then I get this shape, but it's not fully understood uh, still today what what is what is happening there. So uh, yeah, in 2022, uh, one of my collaborators he took me apart. Actually, several groups are, are are working on this right now. So I'm aware also of other groups who who have very similar results. So uh, so Xin Xing Yi was the collaborator who, who uh, we, we talked about in, in summer 22. He told me, yeah, I, I think we have some important progress recently on this problem. And uh, this is uh, what he showed me back then. So this is the particles you can make. You see the edge length is 50 nanometer. Uh, I hope it comes back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there it is. Uh, so here you see it's it's still a little bit rounded. So here we call this the truncation parameter. This will become later important. So it's just one minus L2 minus L1. So it, uh, yeah, they're good enough for our purpose, as you will see. So, and then you put some chemistry on the surface. So this is sort of a, a sulfur, and that's very often used in gold because it binds pretty well with the gold surface. And then there's uh, essentially, it's, you can think of it like a like a long alkane, like a hydrocarbon chain. And there's some functionalization at the end that actually slightly charged so that they don't stick. and and uh, luckily, I don't have to worry about that because, as a theoretician, we don't. We just get the particles, and they just work. And then you you dry them. So you put you put these particle solution. You dry them. What you get here, and I will we'll look at that in a second. So essentially, they form a, a thin layer in on a on a substrate. And one of the key things to do is you have to make the substrate hydrophobic, and I will explain a bit more why. And then when you make this, they form these droplets. And let's actually, if you zoom out, this is how the sample looks like. So this is sort of what they see under the electron microscope. It looks a little bit like your windshield when you drive in the rain and you just went to the car wash before and there's wax on the surface. Mm -hmm. So it forms a very tiny droplets and that's essentially what this is. So droplets of these uh, material on the surface. And then you zoom in and this is sort of one of the droplets. And you get here now, you see here all the tetrahedra that form these rings we mentioned before. And let me zoom in a bit more. 
Uh, actually, here is first the diffraction image. Interestingly, the outer is sixfold, but already here you see that it's twelvefold. I will get back to the sixfold in a second. And then you can look from the side, and here you see the tetrahedra in form of these layers that I mentioned. So it works pretty nicely. You form here, here it is a zoom in. You see here the layers. And uh, so this perpendicular direction. Uh, and now you can do tomography. So we, we, we look from different directions, and then you can extract features. This is one of the columns. There's really experimental data that we cut out. And sort of you can look along the column and you can go through here. And this is this is sort of this column. And now you can cut. So my colleagues, they used what's called a focused ion beam fifth tomography. That means we first try to do to see through the sample, but gold is pretty electron dense, so you cannot really see through it easily. So PIP will prove to be the best option. Mm -hmm. So that means you start with the sample and you it's a destructive technique. You just layer by layer cut it away. And it's just like you see here, and then you image the different layers. And then, for example, you get you get layers like this. So this is the height here. You can do this quite precise, up to a few nanometer uh, precision. And then you sort of here you see you see here the, the tetrahedral cut. And this is sort of from the simulation. So this is we from our simulation result, we also simulated this cutting. And then we get that, and you see a pretty good agreement. And even small features like here, this is the here are the rings, and here's the center of the ring. We sort of see here exactly the same thing. So in the in the paper, this is this is shown, and you can really like here this tiny gap is like just the tetrahedral cut along the edge, and you see part of the edge. It essentially works super super well. And then we can do here. This is a movie in a second, so I will uh, run it. So we will essentially go in the set direction through the structure. This is the experiment. This is the simulation. Uh, and uh, here you see the rings I mentioned. And what you will see if you look at the rings, here's another ring. So it will alternate between the, the, the yellow, the, this five-fold pentagonal five bipyramid, and the purple, which is the 12-member ring. And I will just run this now, and you will, you will sort of see how we go through here, and it works. Pretty, pretty nicely, and you sort of can can go here along the columns. We see here the triangles and the squares, so we see the tiling that I mentioned at the beginning. Is there any long range order, or is it yes. mainly the short range rings, which are not really correlated to the larger distances? It is long range order. It's a quasi crystal, really. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, actually, I didn't. I don't have the. In in the paper, there is the there are the small angle X ray uh, data. I just didn't have time here, mm -hmm. but you can put you can put it to the synchrotron. You can put it under essentially make diffraction like you would do in a real crystal. But now you have to because the structure is large. That means you have to go for smaller angles. It's inverse, mm -hmm. and then the small angle you see you see the small angle peaks. Mm -hmm. Because we have polycrystals, <laughs> big or small. You essentially if you go back. This thing is a single crystal. Oh, the majority. This is a single crystal. Is this a coating of the surface of the droplet that you have? No, it's it's bulk. It's, it's bulk. It's the whole thing is a single crystal. Okay. It's it's flat. Flat. Oh, yeah. uh, this is not flat, but I will get back to this. This is dried. This is dried and it's slightly curved, and the curvature will be important. That's why I spent some time at the beginning to yeah. just know. just wait because that's that's sort of the end of the talk. Sorry, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm almost done. The curvature is actually the last last thing, but maybe maybe uh, there's also another aspect, but I will go through this real quick. So what you can do is you can change the degree of truncation and you get you get these twin shapes. Uh, but what you already see here is that the particles they form something periodic. And that's uh, that's what you what you uh, what you get when you change the truncation. You get these really beautiful uh, superstructures, and I'm I'm pretty amazed by how uh, how uh, monodisperse they can make that. And um, this group can do that, but there are a lot of groups working on nanoparticles which can make uh, very complex, very very regular shapes. So here's a zoom in, and you just see if I would do this by hand, I probably couldn't do it better. Like you can see here the layers. Here's another one. Zoom in. You can see here the tetrahedra, and the, here's a, here's a brain boundary. So here's one crystal. Here's another one. It's like FCC HCP a little bit, 
Actually, in this case, because it's with tetrahedra, it's diamond and another version of diamond, like hexagonal and cubic diamond. And uh, this comes back to these dancers packings I mentioned at the beginning. You can construct these. Uh, there's a cubic diamond variant. There's a hexagonal diamond variant. And all of these are found also in the experiment if you look long enough. And which one you get depends on uh, depending on, they, depends on the degree of truncation and also the experimental condition. Uh, actually, uh, the way you get these, like in the simulation, you get them at high density, but you have to do heterogeneous nucleation. So the quasi crystal forms with homogeneous nucleation, but if you make the substrate not hydrophobic, but or not uh, yeah, hydrophobic, but hydrophilic, then you see that here, then the, 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 the salt solution wets the surface, and then you get. You get the tetrahedra pushed down and you grow, you get growth from the bottom. And you can even improve this by adding the cleatons, and then you get even more heterogeneous nucleation and you get other phases. But let's get back to the truncation and that's the end of the talk. Uh, two more slides. Um, so this one is really curved. Uh, we can put a tiling on top. This again shows it's a single crystal. But what you already see here is that there's an asymmetry. There are these blue triangles and the red triangles. So something is not quite as regular as in the simulation. So here we analyze the tiling, triangles and squares, and we can then look at local environments. These are called vertex configurations or vert vertex figures. We can use this notation that's common in, 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 in tilings, which just says how many triangles and squares you have around one vertex. And uh, so yeah, they are curved, I mentioned that. And now it becomes important that these triangles and squares are curved. And now you can, uh, and yeah, here's sort of how this would look like this baby surface. Now imagine you have a you have a curved surface. What would you? <laughs> if you have a curved surface, uh, and you have now triangles and squares available, well, the idea is maybe you get a bit more triangles than squares. So let's do that. So let's start with a large one. And then we, we we go to a smaller one because we have droplets of different sizes. The, here, look at the ratio of the concave to convex triangles, and then you get more triangles, and then even more triangles. And eventually, if you have a small droplet, you only have triangles left because it's it's curved. So that shows us that the curvature is can change the tiling itself, and this actually is is uh, shows we are. It's, it's a very well equilibrated system. So it can access not only the, the quasi crystal, also different different tiling geometries. And essentially that's that's the end. Thank you very much. Just very briefly. So the quasi crystal one is a feature two dimension because you have these rods. Is it? Yeah, it's periodic in the third yeah, dimension. Yeah. yeah. Um, one clarifying one yeah. leading question. Uh, the truncation parameter you were talking about was a ratio of the two different side lengths, essentially, so not like our typical uh, vertex truncation parameter, but a kind of a particle mix aligned. Yeah, this is something that the experimentalists use that parameter like this, but it's it's a you can convert it into the other parameter. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. Uh, but my question was more about like the diamond structures that you yeah. have them because that's quite difficult to make. Yeah. In colloids, yeah. is it similar to the truncation effects that we saw with like Pablo in my work, or is it? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, the same, it's the same idea, yeah. Okay, same idea. So you think if it's continued to be rounded and rounded and rounded, we would still, still see that same yeah. uh, phase transition? Yeah. We have, we have seen in simulation that truncate. Essentially, what, what happens when you have truncation, then they can flip when they get together because the vertices are in the way uh, of, of them flipping. And then well, we saw a uh, um, uniaxial, uh, uniaxial phase transition. In the truncation family, that's why I'm curious if, it, if it's divergent if it's within that truncation parameter. We can talk more. Yeah, about that. Talk more. I've got great. Uh, maybe one quick clarification. So the experimental, uh, maybe that's yeah, the area. 
2D embryonic structure, right? Yeah. So how did you align the simulation experiment? Well, we had the tomography, and when you have tomography, you have a three-dimensional structure. So it's not just you can you can just rotate it in uh, whatever way you want. But you have to sort of somehow simulate the same local structure and build it out to get the identical mm -hmm. origin. Oh, you, you have to find similar environments, is that what you mean? Yeah. Well, we, we looked we looked in the simulation. Where do we have this? Do I see these? Okay, that's that, 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 the second thing at the end. Your structure is sort of like has a z axis. Yeah. Right. It's it's like, and so the droplets are perhaps probably not going to have the pancake or whatever. Uh, here it is pretty flat, actually, but but that's also bit, because because end, I guess with the calcium curvature is interesting because you know, sort of like, yeah. what. Say or somebody would say that the integrated Gaussian curvature is for the whole droplet is a number, right? And that's yeah. going to tell yeah. you something is comparable between them. But yeah. this is a little bit different because it's only for the, the zero, one line, or whatever you would call that direction. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's an interesting question. Usually, the top pole direction actually points yeah. in this direction. We don't know exactly why that is, but maybe, maybe because yeah, it, it tries. I mean. I would imagine those droplets, they can, they are, they're actually at early stages, they are sort of floating on the, on the substrate. They are not, they, they try not to touch the substrate as little as possible. So they can, they can probably rotate around. And because of the quasi crystal, it probably wants some, some ellipsoidal uh, crystal shape. And then it, it, it just rolls with a flat face to, to lie on the substrate. And that rotates sort of the 12 foot axis to towards the observer. That's sure. how my my just my guess. <coughs> we don't know that, but that's at least one, one last quick one. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can get really uh, is the um, spherical shape that we see here something that's related to the drying process, or is it something built into the structure? That's uh, the interaction, the way things assemble that wants the whole external shape to be spherical. It's a drying process, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority, at least. The, there is a bit, uh, I think it will, it seems to grow more easily in plane than in outer plane. So we know also from crystal growth that crystals can grow very anisotropically. There's a little bit of that, but the majority here is just because of the hydrophobicity of the substrate. You start with a film and then the film breaks into droplets because that minimizes the, 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 the surface energy and then the droplets just dry out. So it's the surface tension of the droplet which is more important than the energies involved in the layering that you have that would favor growth in a specific direction that would flatten maybe the droplet. Yeah, the the the, the, the energy in the, in, 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 in the droplet itself, the, sur the surface energy is pretty high and much higher than the anthropic effects that actually assemble the particles. What's the difference state here? How much is this is This is 10, 20 microns. The whole thing, the nanoparticles are 20. So there are typically 1 million tetrahedra in one of these. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, one so, quick one. Quick question. Just coming back to that last question. Yeah. Yeah. There is a drying process, there is a theory force between particles. Does that play a, a role, or is, I mean, do you think of this as a whole object just compressing slowly? I mean, uh, yeah, we, we were actually asked that by the referee as well. Um, we, we think that um, this, uh, <laughs> I don't think you're really right. I, I, I think, I think that uh, this, this ordering happens when the tetrahedra are still completely in the liquid, so that at that time there are no capillary forces. Essentially, you imagine like it's really a droplet of, of water with the tetrahedra inside, and then eventually the, the droplet evaporates, but then everything is already arrested. Mm -hmm. So once the capillary forces appear, the particles cannot move anyway because they are jammed together. Sort of this happens at a very late stage. Thank you. Cool. Let's thank Mike.